When his parents fled from Chile due to a dictatorship, they thought they did the right thing for their young son's future. They chose to flee to the Netherlands, a country perceived to be peaceful and a safe environment to raise your kids. But this choice might have been the worst decision they could have made, as their son would roll into a life full of crime and would become one of the most notorious drug kingpins in the country. He was friends with ruthless Dutch criminals such as Ridwan Tahi and Gwyneth Martha. He did not shy away from ordering assassinations on his targets, and he had absolutely no problem smuggling large quantities of coke around the world. His name is Richard Eduardo Riquelm Vega, better known as Rico the Chilean. Rico the Chilean was born on the 11th of November 1973, in a small minor town in Chile called Sewell. Nowadays the city is a ghost town, and is totally abandoned because everyone fled in the hopes of a better future. When he was eight years old, he and his family moved to Amsterdam. Because of his double nationality, he speaks fluent Dutch and Spanish, skills which would have come in handy for what he was about to do. As a teenager, he was involved in the graffiti scene in Amsterdam, relatively innocent but did not take long before he was fully immersed into the underworld, where he would become friends with notorious robbers and drug dealers. One of the individuals he became friends with was Gwyneth Martha, at one point in time was the biggest kingpin in the Netherlands. It did not take long before Rico found himself in trouble with the law. 1999 was the first time he actually got jailed, not in the Netherlands, but in Germany, where he was caught attempting to sell a few hundred kilos of coke. Unfortunately for him, these potential buyers turned out to be undercover cops. He was arrested and convicted to serve 11 years in jail. After six years, he was released, but instead of changing his life for the better, it did not take long before he would appear in new police reports. In 2011, undercover police saw something odd happening at Rico's house in Amsterdam. They saw two men with large duffel bags who seemed to be on very high alert. They kept checking their surroundings when entering and exiting the house. Once police made the move and entered the house, they found 30,000 euros in cash. Rico was brought to court for money laundering, but ultimately the judge ruled in his favour and ceased the case due to a lack of evidence. That encounter with the police changed Rico. He knew he wanted no part of being jailed again and had to move more wisely. If the cops could find him that easily, so could potential enemies. He decided to keep a low profile and went under the radar. He was well known in the nightlife in Amsterdam and everybody liked to be around him, but suddenly he vanished. Investigators suspected he moved to between Spain, South America and Dubai, but he never stayed in one place for long. What would happen next is mind-boggling and unbelievable. Moving under the radar did not mean taking things easy for Rico. It was actually quite the opposite. By going under the radar, Rico could focus solely on growing his business and made large leaps scaling up his empire. The Dutch Department of Justice said that he was the leader of at least three criminal organizations which all had their own purpose. One for money laundering, one for cocaine smuggling, and one specifically focused on assassinations. The money laundering business was run by at least 12 confidants of his. These confidants would launder all of the drug money through various other businesses, shell companies, and other illegal structures. His cocaine smuggling business was run with none other than Raphael Imperiale, one of Italy's biggest mob bosses. Together, they would facilitate drug transports in large quantities of cocaine. His third and final business was run with another big name in the underworld, Ridwan Tahi, the Netherlands' biggest and most violent drug smuggler. Rico and Tahi were both bloodthirsty. Together, they would have lists with names and brag about whom they would drop next. They had a group of coordinators who would take on the assignment and proceed to scout the target, find a shooter, and prepare the guns. They used encrypted phones to communicate with each other. A few years ago, the provider of these PGB phones, which stands for pretty good privacy, was hacked. This allowed law enforcement to read every text message these criminals would send to each other. They were so confident in their PGB phones that they spoke freely about most horrific things. Some of the actual messages from Rico Tatahi went as follows. I am here 24 hours, sir, until death and after. You are family, and I can build on you, sir. 
You are me and together we are strong. Rico would call Tahi sir and Tahi would call Rico hermano. These were their nicknames. When one of their friends got arrested in Ireland, the two of them were filled with hate and anger, which they unleashed upon their enemy. Tahi messaged Rico, we are literally going to cut them apart. They will feel what real anger is. After an assassination was successful, the intercepted messages show them cheering saying, whoop whoop, he is dead. Thus far, there is evidence for at least five planned assassinations. Two of them have actually been fulfilled and the other three failed or ultimately were not necessary anymore. There is something interesting though concerning these murders. Even though it is clear as day he is responsible for them, something odd happened which is quite interesting. Stay tuned. His arrest was some sort of full circle moment. As mentioned earlier, his parents fled Chile when he was young. It did not take long before he was fully immersed in the underworld and lived a life on the run from police. As you know, he moved between Spain, South America and Dubai. But ultimately, he would be arrested in the country where his life started, Chile. In 2017, Rico mostly resided in Chile. He lived freely and carefree. He often went to malls and spent large amounts of money on luxury items, ate at fancy restaurants and drove in nice cars. What he did not know was that the Dutch Department of Justice was collaborating with the Chilean Department of Justice to arrest him. The Chilean police force shadowed his every move for some time and finally made the move to arrest him on the 20th of October in 2017. Rico was at a mall. While he was shopping, police surrounded his car. He parked his car in a car park just outside the mall. They were in unmarked vehicles and equipped with heavy automatic guns. Once Rico approached his car, approximately 20 heavily armed policemen aimed their guns at him and ordered him to lay on the ground. They arrested him and immediately brought him to prison. That marked the end of Rico the Chilean. Police later reported that they saw the disappointment in his eyes and he knew it was over for a while. Rico spent five months in a Chilean jail cell before he was extradited to the Netherlands. The interesting part about this extradition from Chile was that they extradited him for two reasons, money laundering and drug trafficking. You might wonder what is so fascinating about that. Well, the fact that they did not extradite him for the two murders he's involved with, because they did not extradite him for that reason among the others. The Dutch Department of Justice cannot prosecute him for those killings. This significantly lessens his sentence and is very positive for him. On the 31st of May, Richard Eduardo Riquelm Vega, also known as Rico the Chilean, was prosecuted to 11 years in prison for being the leader of a criminal gang and money laundering. He will remain in prison in the Netherlands and thus far has not been charged for the murders. That might still happen later on. What do you think? Does he get off easy with only 11 years after all that he has done? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe and please share your thoughts. Stay tuned for many more uploads.